All right, now you uh, also might notice that Mr. Robinson really didn't answer my question about whether he'd be open to paying more taxes now or whether the rich should, but it's a popular debate revived right now back and forth between the powers that be in the Democratic Party are saying that the rich, like Robertson, aren't doing enough uh, and that the Duck Dynasty star and others uh, should be paying up a lot more. To Point Bridge Capital founder and CEO Al Lambert, Brandywine Global Portfolio Manager Jack McIntyre, and the evening edit host and extraordinary <laughs> talent, Elizabeth <laughs> Wicked McDonald. All right, so Lizzie, he is saying that, you know, that is not the answer. Just going after the rich, if they can find a clever way to make money and they get a lot of money doing it, leave it at that, you say? Yeah, I, you know, by the way, I loved your there's no pockets in a funeral shroud uh, talk with Mr. Pretty Robinson much, there. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty funny. Um, you know, I, I love that conversation. I like that we're having this conversation now because I think it's worth pointing out that when we talk about socialism, when you listen to Bernie Sanders, uh, he and Alexandria Cortez have built a long pedigree of ignoring the evidence, of ignoring what the reality is. And, you know, they talk about, for example, Medicare for all. Medicare has private insurance in it uh, for drug coverage and Medicare Advantage. Uh, Bernie Sanders likes to talk about the Nordic model. Denmark's prime minister said, we're not socialists. We're a capitalist model that pays for a welfare state. I mean, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, they don't have a minimum wage. Um, you know, and the Medicare for all thing that they've been touting is to the is to the far left of what China even does. China, you know, people in China have to pay out of pocket. So I just like that the debate is now coming up just to flush out the inaccuracies and the misconceptions that Bernie Sanders is foisting on the American people. You know, though, Al Lambert, the one thing I do notice, regardless of people's personal views on this subject, whether you're in the market or outside the market, it is gaining some traction with voters who by and large say that the rich aren't paying enough and that when it comes to even something like an estate tax, a majority, uh, you know, are for making it higher. When it comes to a wealth tax, a lot of people like the idea of that. So it, it, it is catching fire, uh, and maybe it's because, well, I don't have to pay for that, so I'm for it. But what do you make of it? Well, I think it's so sad because it's such a destructive economic philosophy, 70, 80, 90 percent tax rates, but it's a destructive political message, too, because it plays on base emotions of jealousy and envy and that somehow it's a zero-sum game. If somebody made a million dollars, they took it from somebody else, and therefore they should be taxed at 70, 80, 90 percent and redistribute that money. The kings in Washington will decide where that money should go rather than the person that made it. And, it's, and, and it does work in some cir circles because they believe that philosophy of a zero-sum game. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate because look at the companies, look at Bill Gates as an example. You know, everyone says, oh, well, Bill Gates should pay more in taxes because he can't possibly spend all the money he has. But guess what? If he'd have started Microsoft and had to pay 70, 80, 90 percent taxes, he would have never been able to create the thousands of millionaires that he created in the best software, the be biggest software company in the world. Yeah, and but having, the said, that, that was having said that, when Microsoft started, we did have a 70% top rate, right? So, so I know what you said. It went down and the environment improved. I think of Home Depot, which also started mm -hmm. under much higher rates, a much more dicey economic environment, Jack. I'm just wondering um, where this is going because... Uh, you know, I'm for, all for, if you want to look at the revenue picture, great, but you better look at the spending picture because yeah. that's the core of the problem. <laughs> yeah, right, and, and socialism isn't going to solve that part of the, the equation. So one of the things, just going back to your topic, what scares me because, you know, we need capital to be put at risk. You know, entrepreneurialism, I mean, that's the, the backbone of the economy. And if we disincentivize that, we always hear about the winners, the people doing well. You never hear about the guys that put their, their capital at risk and, and they didn't do well. And if we go down a socialist path, I just, I don't think you're gonna see people willing to, to put capital at risk uh, with the idea being that, hey, we're gonna get these great companies, the Microsofts, the Amazons, the things that start out obviously very small, but somebody's gotta be willing to, to put capital at risk yeah, exactly. to go down that path. And we're you not know, gonna and, do that. And Neil, yeah. you know, Chuck Schumer, Bernie Sanders, Alexander Cortez, they've never run a business. Um, I understand what they're saying about high taxes, but you know, the high tax on the upper bracket or the wealth tax wouldn't even pay for Medicare for all. And if you want to talk about income inequality, look where income inequality is now at its most 
most severe. It's in Venezuela. So when you start taking people's um, income in the form of taxation, what happens is governments get bigger. The people inside the government sometimes, oftentimes, they turn corrupt. And when you have socialism, it's often an economy run at the tip of a gun. So you know, the, you watch the watch the income inequality debate because they they think that raising taxes will solve income inequality in this country. Uniformly, that doesn't happen. What happens is the government just get bigger, just gets bigger. They go back, Hal, to what life was like in the 1950s and the early 60s, and even after JFK's tax cuts took effect, sadly after his death, <clears throat> but the rates were much higher. Excuse me. And they say the chasm was narrower then between the super rich and the not so rich. Now it's widened out tremendously, and the only way to fix that is to forcibly raise taxes to, to actually get it narrower. Is that a good idea? Well, look, no, because the, the tax rates were higher, yes, but there were massive deductions back then. So you, you had a yeah, high tax rate and then you had a lot that? of deductions. How many people paid What's that? That's a good point. Yeah, maybe three Yeah, people. very few people paid it. Very <laughs> few people. Look, I'm so happy that President Trump attacked socialism directly last night. But you know what else? He actually attacked it indirectly as well. From the beginning of his speech, when he talked about D-Day and freeing Europe, what was he talking about? What did we free Europe from? The National Socialist Germans Workers' Party. The Nazis were socialist. And what, what if we, be, we became the most powerful, exceptional country in the world, we put someone on the moon, and look where we are today at the economy. We have the strongest economy out there in the world right now. And then he talked about the future and where we're going and what we can do as a country. And he's basically saying, look, why would you want to change this country that's been the greatest, most exceptional country in the world to something like Venezuela's model? It makes no sense. Well, no, you're right. But, you know, Jack, I'll get back to that socialism argument. You ask a lot of Americans, what do you think of socialism? They don't like it, I, I, depending on the survey. But when you talk about Medicare for all, college for all, you're, it's not on, on, on your wallet, it's on someone else's wallet, then the poll numbers get to be very different. I just think that, you know, Republicans and those who espouse capitalism are underestimating the strength of this movement. Um, it's palpable, it's real, and it has a great deal of support. Um, what do you think? I, I agree. So we've talked about the, the wealth dispersion the income dispersion. So go back, you know, that government shutdown that we just had, it's amazing and it underscores the fact there are so many people living from paycheck to paycheck. Add on the Fed study that 40% of U.S. adults don't have $400 for a financial emergency. Um, it's not surprising because you look at uh, the, the wealth that the equity market where it is, not every, unfortunately, not everybody is benefiting from that. So you've got this groundswell of people that haven't lived under uh, when socialism sort of dominated uh, the, the global economy. So it sounds good on paper, but it, it, there is clearly risk. And, you know, if we talk about Venezuela, that is the poster child for what can go wrong under a socialist uh, regime. All right. Final word on the subject. I want to thank you all. Very sure. much appreciate it.